everybody, welcome to another episode of Behind the Scenes by Just Baseball Media. As always, I'm Jared Perkins. We got Caleb Mezzi in the right. We got our new co-host, PJ Conlon, uh, who's joining us to bring in a little bit of a player perspective that we've been missing. Uh, we have an incredible guest with us today, uh, Brandlin Kinsler, 12-year uh, reliever in the major leagues, uh, all-star in 2017, pitched for six different teams, uh, now is the host of the Call to the Pen show, along with Steven Shishak. Um, uh, Brandon, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, we're excited to have you on. I uh, just want to kick things off just having you give the, the viewers who don't, uh, for all those people who don't know you, a little bit of background on yourself, uh, kind of how you got uh, through your journey in professional baseball, um, what's led you to start doing the podcast, and some of the passions you have outside of the game. All right, so I was a 40th round draft pick twice, back-to-back -back years. That's tough to do. <laughs> and then uh, I got released by the Padres in 05. Maybe, yeah, 06. I had shoulder surgery, and I uh, went to independent ball for three years. Basically, I got to go learn how to pitch while I got healthy. And then while I was playing independent ball, I just kind of learned how to start throwing two seamers because I was getting killed because my shoulder wasn't uh, healthy enough yet to throw hard. So I just learned how to learn how to pitch while I was there. Then finally, I got healthy, and then the velocity started to come, and the Brewers signed me out of independent ball after an all-star game there. And I just got hot, man. I just had nothing to lose. And I was in the big leagues a year later and never looked back and battled some injuries here and there. A lot of, a lot of ups and downs. But uh, I think I wouldn't trade. I wouldn't trade it for the world just because of my journey. And I appreciate yeah. every day I had. Yeah, I mean, that's incredible. I, the first question that comes to my mind, right, is you had all those moments of adversity. You had to go through independent ball. A lot of guys would have given up on the journey uh, right there. And then what motivated you and kept you kind of moving forward? I just really had nothing to go home to. This is it because I didn't really – I messed up. I probably didn't take school very seriously because I uh, just thought baseball – I was throwing hard in college. You just think you're just going to be the guy yeah. and everyone's going to go to the big leagues. But – um, and I thought I would get out – when I went to independent ball, I thought I would get out of there in a heartbeat. I was rookie of the year there and just nobody cares. <laughs> nobody really cares about independent ball. And uh, it's hard to get out of there. It's harder to get out of there than it is to get back in the affiliated yeah. ball, I think. Um, and then after a couple of years, I was just like, you know, I'm just want to at least take my training a little more serious so I can get healthy. So if I get healthy, let me see what happens. And maybe this will be my last year. So I asked to get traded out of Canada to St. Paul, Minnesota, where I figured there'd be more scouts. And then I just focused on what I was doing and stopped partying in Canada. It's kind of <laughs> tough when you're a little underage, but you can go out in Canada and you're having too much fun and you get distracted. So I just took a little more serious and then took off. Yeah. Uh, Caleb, I'll turn it over to you if you got some questions. Yeah, I mean, stemming off that and the kind of themes that we see during this podcast, one of the things we talk about is identity. And I think what it's clear, and, you know, I'm, I'm a college professor, so I understand what you're saying about the school because I've had many student athletes in my classes. But I would say it seems you identified as a baseball player through and through, whether it was the ups and downs and you had a plan A and really no sight of plan B. During those, you know, times of adversity or the times of question, should I be doing this or should I have a second, you know, plan in place? Was your identity wavering at all? Were you seeing anything different with, you know, the mental side of the game or really just your everyday life? Well, it's growing up in Vegas. I feel like you can always there's an easy you can always get an easy job. So it wasn't like there was no job that was going to identify. I can I know everybody growing up here. I can go somewhere and get something out of a casino or something, even a valet job. So I always knew the easy money would be at home. So all I needed to do was just take myself seriously. Though, like I took it seriously, getting hurt, and then uh, once you're 19 years old, and they send you to Canada, and I mean it's not the best thing in the world to do, and you're out by yourself. And then I come back home, get a valet job, and work. And I was just like, you know what? I'm tired of just not taking my myself serious. It's time to grow up a little bit. So. I always, thought, I always thought I was a very talented baseball player, but uh, I think I, my identity didn't take till I got to probably 22, 23, where I was like, okay, I'm going to be a baseball player. I'm going to try to be a, a real professional. And from there on, I just think that's what, that was my mentality is I'm just, this is my job. I don't mess around. When I go to training, I don't mess around. Like, this is it. So once that happened, I mean, the mentality was just, you could, I, you could not stop me. One of the follow-ups I have to that, and this kind of goes, you know, hand in hand with identity, is 
I always joke, you you ask 10 baseball players why they like baseball, and you'll actually get probably nine different answers. It's not because of the complexity of the sport, but it's really we all have different driving forces, and we all see the game with, you know, different perspectives. I know perspective is a big part of what, you you know, you envision, but you being a reliever, someone who has to have the ball in their hands to, you know, be on the field and perform, um, I, I guess what I'm asking is, like, were you able to see, you know, either a different perspective or were you able to see something in your game that, you know, kind of drove you and maybe that change with the identity uh, shift that you just mentioned? I think pitching and uh, performing at high leverage was what drove me. Uh, his reality, like, it's hard for me to even watch baseball right now. Like, I don't know if I really like it anymore. It's probably why I retired. <laughs> I stopped liking it. <laughs> but, but my high, I just loved, once you got a taste of pitching in high leverage, mm. You just cannot go to any other role. And I, that just drove me every day, every off season. But then once a manager starts to say you get hurt and you're coming back and then one team doesn't value your high leverage and you're in another role, it's so hard to stay motivated and be present. And you want to be a great teammate. Like everyone says, I just want to be a good teammate. And you're trying to do your job. But when you've been an all-star closer or whatever, and then all of a sudden some team has you says, oh, you got to be ready from the second to eighth inning. Like, how the hell is that even possible? <laughs> like, did you not know? Like, I thought I came here because I was a closer, but now you brought me here to be your sec second inning guy. So I just lost, I lost interest. You just, they lost me mentally. So my drive force every week, every off season. Yeah. I wanted to be high leverage. I wanted to be seventh, eighth inning, ninth inning guy. I wanted the, the crowd to be nuts and you just feel alive when that happens. You cannot, you just cannot replicate it anywhere else. I love that answer. I'm going to, Save that for the end because I have a follow-up to that, but I'll let PJ uh, just dive in. Yeah, uh, just for me, um, what you touched on, you know, being a two-time 40th round pick and then the shoulder surgery, going to independent ball. Did your confidence ever waver during that period or were you just kind of like, you know, this is the road that I'm on and I'm, I'm just going to, you know, roll with it and this is how it's meant to be? I think when I was young, say I was young, my first surgery, you just didn't think about it like, oh, I'll rehab this and I'll be back in no time. But that was a tough rehab. I went, when I went to independent ball, I was still pretty hurt. So that's why I'm like, my confidence, but I still dominated pretty good my first year. So then my next year, I thought I was, I was kind of cocky a little bit, but it's freaking independent ball, so nobody cares. But, uh, and I got killed. I got absolutely smoked. And then, uh, so then I was like, all right, if I, once I get confident, once I get strong, I'll get confident again. So then when I was healthy and I made it all the way to the big leagues, I'm feeling good. And then I had another surgery, I had elbow surgery. As soon as I got to the big leagues, my first full season, and that was tough to come back. And then I got designated. So that, and then, so your confidence really starts to waver because they send you to Double A. I mean, no one, you're, and you got yeah. designated. Now you're off the roster. So yeah. either if you don't pitch well, I mean, you're going to be out of the game. And then my wife told me I need to man up and stop worrying about my elbow. So then it, I just really just turned it on from there. And then, <laughs> uh, then I had another knee surgery three years later. It's freaking couldn't catch a break so then and then I, that was when i was worried about because that was my landing leg and my velocity wasn't returning it was taking a long time that was my confidence really started waver. i didn't know if i was ever going to be the same because arm thing you feel like you, you know what you're feeling the leg wise you're like is it healthy i can't tell my stuff's not the same but my arm feels great and uh that was a tough one to come back from it took probably that probably took two years for my confidence to get back from that one and then uh just the next one um you said you know, when you were like 22, 23, you kind of took that next step into, you know, taking it more seriously, your training, you know, your rehab, you know, making this your goal of making it to the big leagues. What do you think the biggest change was? Was it your work ethic or like you mentioned, like not partying as much? Like what would you say was the biggest, um, you know, change that you made that allowed you to take that next step? Right. I would say routine uh because they let me be a starter at the time so routine was really good um i was all my training was really good but my routine as far as daily preparation getting in my condition back then everyone ran for so long you know now no one runs forever but back then get my all my running in my lifting in just my mental approach because once you get because once i got back in independent or out of independent ball into affiliate ball you're, you're so close like and you're i was in double a you're so i mean you're one call away you just got to get hot for one minute and uh, so I just, that was my approach. It's just like, if I could just figure this out, get hot, you know, you just never know. You just never know. But if I don't take this serious, I'll definitely never know. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I want to at least give myself the best chance 
And if, and if I did everything I could and I didn't make it, then I could, I could walk away and I'd be fine with it because I was already a 40th round pick. No one expected me to make it anyways. But, um, yeah, as soon as my I've learned a routine, my, and it takes the, the mental training, to, it takes years. It probably took me six, seven years in the big leagues to learn how to be mentally prepared and present. I mean, that's tough. A lot of people ask you, Oh, how'd you get so mentally tough? Like you, a lot of failure, probably. <laughs> <laughs> With that question that PJ had, though, I mean, I think it's a really good one. So you, you say routine training, and then you just talk about mental toughness. Were there any mentors that you had? I mean, it doesn't mean that we have to know who they are, but maybe right. affiliate you had some, maybe some coaches, maybe it's parents. Or when you um, came you know, to the show, like, were there any guys who took you under the wing and said, I, I see a future for you. I see you in these kind of roles, and I also went through that. Probably a number of people throughout each year. Um, my first – I would say when I got to the big leagues – Trevor Hoffman was there my first mm -hmm. month. Pretty good one. Yeah. yeah, and that was straight routine. Like, you want to learn a routine real fast. I mean, it was called Camp Hoffman. Every day you had to run two miles with a guy with your shirt off, whether it's freezing <laughs> cold or not. And you had to do everything he did. That was what I learned about ice baths awesome. right away. And I was like, I was not an ice person, but this guy did it every day. And I was like, if he's going to do it, I guess I'll do it. It was freezing. It was miserable. And then, um, so I learned basically how the reliever life was, and then to get confidence back, it's funny because Craig Council was there when I was, it was, this was 2011 and they just called me back up because they sent me down for like a week and I had great stuff and it was like a two inning relief outing. We're getting blown out though, but I had great stuff and I gave up a solo homer and I was just kind of pissed off. You know, you always feel like you're getting sent back down and he just happened to sit down. He's like, that was a very impressive outing. He goes, if you just attack like that with that stuff, you'll, you'll be here a long time. And I was like, dang. Like Craig Council said that <laughs> in my next outing, I had a, it was a very next day. It was like a Monday night baseball game. And I struck out the side, got my first win. It was like such a great feeling. And so two guys right there, my first two years were huge in my, and just in my career to get it started. And then as it went on, um, I just, you have, I have different, I had K rod was there. And then he was a very, very tough guy, like tough guy to deal with in the bullpen. He was very tough on you. He did not let you slack. So that was good to have. You always had to be on your game. And then uh, I, I don't know if you guys remember Eddie Gordado. Yeah. I yes. knew him since I was like 10 years old. And I've, <laughs> he was always a tough guy, but he was our bullpen coach. And I, that's why I signed to Minnesota as a, fr, a minor league free agent. And he was there. And then he just helped me take off because he didn't. He would never let me get me high. If I ever felt good about myself, he would bring me right back down. If I was ever down about myself, he'd be like, the sun's coming up tomorrow. Stop being a baby. So that was where I really started to take off because I got to have him there every day. I was sad to get traded from there. Can I ask yeah. a follow-up question to that? It's a very specific one. So I'm, you know, I'm a Phillies fan. You can tell probably from the background, but you had this, you had this nickname. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if anybody still calls you this nickname, but Salt. Yeah, so salt yeah. has to come from somebody else. I, I don't think that's a name that you give yourself. No, definitely not. Um, I was uh 2016. I was in Triple A, and no one's ever happy to be in Triple A. And uh, I don't know. I guess I was salty. And but the thing is, there was a guy that had a very bad haircut. He looked like the creepy guy on the movie Ted. So I was like, "Dang, man, you look like he." I called him Ted, and we got on the bus one day, and he's like, "Well, what? Are, well, you're." He called me Morton. I was like, "Morton?" He goes, "Salt." He goes, "You're a salty bastard," and I was, and everyone just like <laughs> started calling me Salt. And then I got called up to Minnesota, and then somehow I went from Rochester to there, and they started calling me Salt. I just feel like that ended up being like, like you know how Mamba mentality or whatever. But that's like when I show up to the stadium, saltiness was what kept me locked in. Like I was just bitter i was on everything like i was locked in that should be me I'm, so everyone just thought i was just always salty but i i ran with it and it just that's what helped me for the next seven years i guess <laughs> everyone still calls me salt uh, i i don't mind i love that i love that i one thing i want to go into too kayla probably has additional questions on this but kind of how you've transitioned to life after baseball right you've started the podcast the call to the pen show um how have you developed some of the passions away from the game and what, what have been some of the biggest changes to your kind of daily routine and things like that uh, now that you're out of the game? Yeah, it's been, it was a little tough at first. I would say last summer was like my first full summer home. It was fun, but then you like, you hit a depression zone 
And then uh, I was like, that's why I went and like tried to play for a second. And soon I was like, I, I was like, oh, I can, I want to go play. I'm, I'm hungry again. I got, as soon as I showed up to AAA, I would want to go back home. I was like, this is stupid. I don't even want to be here anymore. But that was when I knew if I didn't want to be there, I needed to go home. So I went home, you know, it's just, you get st- the, the kids don't care whether you're sad or not. You got to take them to school. You got to get in the routine and you just start, you just hop in and you start doing it. And then I raced BMX with my son. So that's been a lot of fun. We've traveled the country racing. And um, and then the podcast, I was just like, hit up. Me and Steve Ciszek were really good uh, friends at, in Chicago. But we it was like a comedy show every day. It was like we would talk so much crap to each other. But everyone enjoyed it. It was like fun. And we had a lot of fun as throwing partners. So I feel like we're so opposite. And but we have such good uh, opinions on the game, but we're, he's always super positive. I'm always super negative. I think everybody sucks, <laughs> and then he thinks everyone's really good. So I think if we just go back and forth on it, and I mean it's been fun. I think we should at some point maybe we'll do more on it. But uh, so far, my passion is just like I, my routine. As I wake up, I started training people at my house, my gym at my house, just to try to help other people. I enjoy seeing other people succeed. So if I could help yeah. them, I get a little more. I get feel like I'm part of it. You know, I feel like I'm still competing at something. But other than that, I mean, it's just a very boring day. <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the things you said is the performing at high leverage situations. I think, number one, it goes without saying, having kids is always a high leverage situation. Oh, man. And maybe it doesn't have to be, but once you add the plural, kids, it yeah. is. Uh, <laughs> and then you mentioned BMX. I mean, I just hearing BMX makes me feel like it's a high leverage situation. I've never done it. I don't think I want to. Um, but how are you finding that same you know, need and that, you know, want for adrenaline in your everyday life. I, I may have answered the question, but I just want right. to. Well, so the day that I left Philly, I went to the track with my kid and I rode for two hours. But the second, so you get in a gate, and there's eight other people in there. So it's raw power, you against every other guy. So all of a sudden I got this huge adrenaline rush. I'm like, I haven't felt this in a yes. long time. Because think about it, 2020, we had no fans. <laughs> so, but I, even though I was closing, we're in the playoffs, but there was no fans. So the yep. adrenaline rush was really tough to replicate. So I haven't anything. I haven't had a rush in three years, and all of a sudden I just felt it, and I was like, "Man, this is fun. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna do this. I'll just travel with him, train him, and we'll have, we'll do this." And then, so it keeps me training. That's the thing. So I wake up and I'll train, and it keeps me in shape, and I get to go compete against some guys that they want to beat the baseball player. I mean, these guys tried to kill me the first year, like <laughs> kill me. I think I crashed like eight times the first month. It was brutal. And the kids wise, holy crap, when they get home from school, it's like all hands on deck. You got to be on your game. <laughs> it's so hard. It is. I, I was going to ask a question. It's kind of unrelated to the transition. And I wanted to go back to the salt thing. Okay. Um, but I know you look for an edge. I can tell that. I think that's where the salt you know, name kind of comes from. But um, there was an incident in Philadelphia with Ricky Bow, And I think you know what I'm talking about. So I'm not going to name the whole thing. Um, it's funny to me as a fan because I grew up in this area and I heard and saw Ricky Bo play. He was very similar to you. Right. When he said what he said, and I won't do it unless you want to clarify what he said <laughs> um, about you, what did that do for you at that time in your career? What did that do for you? I mean, you mentioned the 2020 season, which was kind of insane to just even you know, right. write this about. But what did that do for you? Because we often talk about on this you know, podcast – taking control of the narrative, like telling your own story that kind of happens without you knowing about it. Sometimes you may hear about it. You may hear about it through other people, but in this case, I think it was designated to you. You knew about this and it obviously had, you know, some effect positive and negative. Right. So, I mean, I'll say, it. uh, so we just had a great game against Phil opening day. Alcantara dealt. I mean, we just, it was a really good dominating game. I think, I don't even know, I think Wheeler, or I don't know who started that game. Might have been Arietta, somebody. But yeah, it was I a good game. Uh, we're in the clubhouse, all, we're, TV's on, and he's on there. He goes, the Phillies cannot lose to the bottom feeders. You know, the Marlins are the bottom feeders, but they can't lose to them. And we're just like, what? It's like Alcantara was just throwing 98 miles an hour. <laughs> And we just dominated them. How do you even call us bottom feeders? So it pissed us off. Like, I thought we were a good team and we just dominated the game. It wasn't like they got lucky. It was a domination. And then, uh, so then we got COVID and then we were stuck in the hotel room for 10 days. And it just, we just kept stirring the pot with that. It kept calling ourselves the bottom feeders. You guys suck. And we, we just, 
So then by the time we got out of that hotel, we were just pissed, like just extremely pissed about what they said about us. Everyone said so many things about us. So we just ran with it. And then we dominated the Phillies that whole year. And then they had to come to us for like a seven game series towards the end of that COVID year. And then we won five out of seven. So that really just raised up the bottom feeders. We're constantly saying it, but it wasn't my idea to put it on a t-shirt. All of a sudden we show up <laughs> to the playoffs and it's on a t-shirt. So then, I mean, that they just rallied us and that was a team that, cause we're already like not supposed to be there. So why, if you're going to take a bunch of young talent, people that aren't supposed to be there and you're going to motivate us, I think you just become an unstoppable force. So I, for us to stay tight knit, that just kept us tight knit because we just want to keep you suck, you suck, you suck. You're a bottom feeder, you don't belong here. So that way you show up and you're a little pissed off and you have some edge. So I definitely wanted to call him out and thank him for that motivation because we got to sweep the Cubs and move on to the next series. I probably should have waited till after we beat if we would have beaten the Braves and then said it because we could at least win another round. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you just gotta find those little things that get you motivated. Uh, before I kind of roll in the last question, PJ, I want to turn it over to you unless you have some more. Um, yeah, uh, just for me, because um, one of the things I wanted to ask you, I pitched, I only pitched three games in the big leagues. I'm the quintessential cup of coffee guy. And, you, you know, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can at least hang my hat on that. But yeah, I want to know that feeling, you know, of getting that call to the All-Star game, you know, because you're like 40th round pick to make it to the All-Star game. Like, you don't hear stuff like that. Right. Like, was that something that, you know, was one of your goals you're like you know this i can make it here or was it kind of just like icing on the cake at that point i think uh once you become a closer i mean you always will think oh we'd love to make the all-star game and it's tough as a reliever you have to be a closer to, to really make it or have an ungodly first half probably give up one run or something mm -hmm. but uh i had a really really good first first month i think i had i gave up one run i had a crap loaded i was leading the league in saves and I was like, you know what? They never know. It could be an opportunity. But I didn't want to think about it because it would distract me from the goal. So I just wanted to put my head back down, and I just grinded, stay really focused. Next thing you know, the they did the All-Star uh, nominations probably one week, and they, I wasn't one of the guys on the team. And it, I, it kind of hurt my feelings, but I was like, you know what? I wasn't supposed to make it anyways. It's just expected. Of course I won't make it. I'm not supposed to be there. They'll never pick me. Mm -hmm. So that, I didn't even think about it anymore. No, and then uh, a week goes by. So I had like 23, 24 saves at the break and it was like a two year RA and I'm at breakfast and then I see my phone ring and it's Paul Molitor. I'm like, I was like, Oh man, am I getting traded already? Like, shit. <laughs> and so then he, he told me that I was congratulations. You're going to the all-star game that I was like, and I had just booked a cabin to go for the all-star break. Like I had just, booked <laughs> so I was like, I don't even know if I can get my money back, but it was like, it was such an emotional feeling because I'm not supposed to be that guy. And all of a sudden mm -hmm. I just, I feel like maybe this could help the guys that aren't supposed to be there. Maybe they'll realize it's possible for them. And then when it was emotional, as soon as I went to the clubhouse and then they like played my intro music and they congratulated me and stuff. And so that was cool. All of a sudden, like they really, the team was on what was behind me. So all of a sudden now, now you feel really important because you feel like you're one yeah. of their guys. But then I all I wanted to do was just be on the line and hear my name called. And once that happened, I was just kind of like in the days. That was probably the best feeling in the world. I just wanted to be very present in that situation. And I don't even care if I pitch or not. And they, mm -hmm. they gave me the fifth inning. They said, you're going to have the fifth inning. I thought that was amazing. The fact that they That's gave awesome. me an inning. So it just felt, I mean, it was amazing. An amazing experience. I always wish I could have went back. But uh, I just knew that I just want to be present in every situation. Because, I mean, that's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, really. Yeah, and then just one more quick thing. Which call was better, getting called to the big leagues or getting the call you're going to the All-Star game? I was – I mean, it, it sucks. It's hard to say because I felt like the big leagues saw it coming. I just had a really good – you kind of saw it coming. You just never – I mean, it's emotional because it's like finally my goals are reached. But the All-Star game is like now you're like – you're going to go to the game with – the top five percent in the game so i felt like that was a better call it was very unexpected i hate to say it was i i expected to go to billy because that just sounds very that's too confident but i kind of did so yeah. but the other one was very surprising and emotional awesome. yeah that's incredible um it just it's awesome to hear your journey and kind of overcoming all that adversity to make it to the big leagues, to become an all-star. Um, it's just awesome to just have you open up and share that story with us. Uh, the last question we always ask all our guests, um, 
because we want this to be an opportunity for everybody to get uh, a, a, to get a peek behind the human beings that play the game, but also an opportunity for younger athletes who are coming up and to get some advice uh, from guys who've been through it already. So if you have one piece of advice for the next generation of players, uh, what would that one piece of advice be? I always just said hard work pays off. And I always say hard work pays off and the game will pay you back in some way or the other, whether who knows you can go across this to japan or whatever somehow if you just put your head down and grind hard work will pay off so that's something eddie always told me when i was a kid hard work will pay off and i always just stuck to that mantra of it's going to pay off whether just don't lose confidence just keep working hard and it's going to pay off i love it i think that's an awesome thing to wrap up on uh, but before we go uh, where can everybody find the podcast and all the work you're doing oh uh, let's see we're on you are know, instagram call of the pen we're on youtube apple uh, what is it spotify we're on we're we're trying to be everywhere we just don't do too much we're trying to do one show a week steve steve's not and he's not too uh bored yet being retired i'm waiting for him to get extremely bored and maybe he'll want to do more so this is only his first year of retirement he'll come around <laughs> i love it everybody make sure to check out call the pen uh, brandon we can't again thank you enough for thank joining you. us uh wishing you nothing but the best thank you guys thanks for having me keep doing good work <laughs>